Our story begins on a night where the moon shone over a towering tower, barely visible from the top. And on the city wall, a car stops in front of two very large buildings, then we follow the steps of someone who should be the team leader. Some employees ask with surprise about his sudden presence. The person says that everyone left work and disappeared, the well-groomed man with glasses seemed nervous, he says with fear that the rating displayed on the computer screen was immeasurable. The man remembers that there were only two cases where the hunter rating measurement device displayed the message immeasurable. The man walks while being followed by a couple of researchers, they warn him that a new measurement device that arrived from New York had arrived by express delivery and it was already turned on, the man in a suit asks if that person had already arrived, and they confirm that yes. The man then straightens his suit while thinking it could just be a malfunction because the Korean devices were still very old models. The man then opens the door, still exuding concern thinking that if that wasn't the case that person could solve it. But soon we are introduced to that person a young person drinking juice from a carton and swinging their feet barely touching the ground. That person seemed like a child, sitting accompanied by two security guards in suits. The team leader then asks the young person's name, the young person tries to change the subject, he then insists on asking their age, and the young person just says that they'll be in fourth grade in two days. The young person then becomes serious and asks if when you register as an awakened person, they ask your age or something similar, and asks if it wasn't an invasion of privacy while swinging their feet, the team leader then bows slightly while apologizing, the man thought it was increasingly problematic to underestimate today's children. A woman approaches calling the team leader, she asks if the maximum rating of the old device was AA and says while reading a document that maybe it could end up as the team leader expected. The leader then says he doesn't want to receive any calls after he leaves work, and the woman then says she'll do it that way. She then interrupts her coffee sip to ask if even if he was right, would that really be a problem, and asks if he had seen the report. Joan Joying's report pointed to him as a third grade boy, and that's an early awakening at just nine years old. The young man's report reflected in the team leader's glasses, as he thought the fate of the country was at stake. Because there were no S-class individuals in Korea. Many people fell, the memories of the funeral plaque in which the leader participated still hurt him. In the waiting room, someone tells him not to hold out hope. If it's just a simple error, the leader wonders what can be done about it. Soon one of the scientists enters with a phone in hand, he says the measurement room setup was complete. Joan is then taken down a path, they soon enter the measurement room inside the room, we see a core surrounded by several rings. Everyone analyzes as someone commands the warrior to awaken, and someone pulls a lever indicating that the identity verification was completed. Young Joan is connected inside a tube by several smaller tubes, soon power starts flowing around Joan, but it soon goes out of control and illuminates the entire room and Joan's final rating turns out to be rank S, which leaves the team leader completely amazed. Everyone in the room including the leader seemed to not believe what their eyes were showing them. Soon a bright light appears in the middle of the city, and a system window opens congratulating Korea. The following windows said that Korea had awakened its first rank S, which left the local server of South Korea expanding with the awakening of the strongest leader. The country ended up passing through the list of general management countries. It was now on the list of high-priority management countries. Joan seemed amazed, enchanted to see all those windows floating around herself. Another window appears saying that the high-ranking stars are located in Korea's Babel Tower, the Celestial Gate. The whole team goes into euphoria for finally having a location like that in Korea, now they could have some hope. The team leader speaks to Joan through the microphone, asking her what kind of divine star that would be. Soon the team wonders why they didn't call the director, and then schedule it for tomorrow morning at the so-called Blue House. Meanwhile, Joan removes the tubes from her head, wondering why there were so many people there. Soon she sees three more system windows, saying that all rankings had been updated, the location being South Korea. Joan was ranked first in the first channel of the local server. She wondered if it was really serious, 
and if it really had to be like that. Soon a window says that her contractor was feeling very offended, and soon they start arguing through the system windows. She still didn't seem so excited, soon some scientists approach very excited, one of them introduces himself as responsible for management. But this sudden approach scares the young girl, she wonders what she would be able to do now. She finally begins to understand that it seems like she has conquered the first place in Korea. Soon we are taken to various places in the world where gigantic towers existed, such as Egypt, London in England. People were impressed by the colossal size of the Babel towers that began to appear all over the world, all means of communication covered the appearance of the towers, but with modern technology they couldn't find out anything. Children were afraid thinking if it could have been built by aliens. The fear and confusion of people were present all over the place even in newspaper pages. At the moment they become uncontrollable, people soon see something scary after the towers hovering in the sky. A giant portal opens in the middle of the city, and soon we see a scaly being hovering in the sky. Soon a horde of monsters appeared out of nowhere, an attack without warning. A surge of portals was the most sought-after item on the internet. Cracks that simultaneously appeared all over the world literally dumped monsters from another dimension through those portals. Humans did their best to face the monsters with military ammunition, but it seemed impossible to defeat them completely. But someone emerged at that moment, those who dramatically changed the situation appeared, and since then, the world has changed. Soon we are taken to a peaceful morning in the city. Currently at house number one on Serbiol Street, we see Joan with her headphones playing on her cell phone, soon her older brother, Jai Rock, the second son of the Joan family, an S-rank hunter, catches her attention. When ignored, he tells her to open her ears or read the Kakotok messages, at least do something, and deeply regrets buying the phone for her. She then takes off her headphones saying she got the last one, tonight would be chicken for dinner, she then turns to her brother and asks why he came there. Joan was now much bigger and asks if he needed someone. Her brother asks irritably if she was kidding him, she didn't check the channel. He says someone was fleeing from the tower after reading the latest news, he then shows her a news article on his phone. On the phone screen, it said that number one Timoth Lillywhite participated in the expedition and asks if his sister isn't impressed by that. She says while yawning that Americans are very hardworking which completely bewilders her brother. He then shouts, catching his sister's attention. He tells her to stop playing hide and seek and invites her to conquer the tower, adding that she shouldn't leave the house. Soon a system window opens saying that her contractor, the Destiny Reader, enthusiastically applauded in the face of her brother's outburst of anger. But his sister seemed somewhat indifferent about her duties. We find out that the era of the Awakened has begun. In other words, the era of hunters. The lower floor of the Babel Tower was called the Tutorial. Those who received tickets to enter Babel became awakened. Through the same tutorial, those who were awakened thus had two paths to follow. One awakened, the path where someone would risk their life climbing a high difficulty tower being represented by the pure faction. Or the low difficulty one, accumulating experience steadily in easier dungeons or the runaways and among them, the representative of the pure faction, Gio's younger brother. His registration name in the tower was Bambi. He was exactly 11 years younger than her, the fourth in Korea's class. Since he was young, he had an unusual determination. As soon as he received the ticket to the tower, he threw himself in like a fish in water. Even against gigantic monsters, he used his powers without hesitation. The giant bear prepares an attack, while he held his spear still. His gaze had not a single trace of fear, in the next frame he had already pierced the rabbit's body with his powerful spear. He cleans his hands thinking it was nothing. But we also find out that if you're from the pure faction, or the runaways, there's a chance that undermines all these ecosystems, it's much harder and rarer than winning the lottery or the Super Bowl, a person chosen by the stars called a lone star. And that was her third place in the current world ranking, first place in Korea. We see her imposing figure with her gigantic scythe, being presented as a wizard king. But at home, she was just Joan Jill. And at home, a woman enters looking for Jill. 
This was Joan G.M. He. She was in the third year of high school. The youngest daughter of the Joan family, the family's Jun YouTuber. Gio greets G.M. and asks how she did in school today. She says she thought it would be better if she left home earlier today because her mother had found something. The simulated exam bulletin, which catches Gio's attention, and she asks why Gio had hidden it, because she wouldn't be able to fool her. Gio asks what time her mother would arrive, and she says now, and says five with her hand, which leaves her puzzled, but soon she makes the sign of four, then three, then two, and then one, and soon someone activates an ability called Cat Parker. It was Gio who jumps high above her house, she was gradually accumulating bad bulletins. A student who failed the university exam three times. Gio finds herself still hovering in the sky, and soon she lands at the base of what seemed to be a pole. She had a candy in her mouth as she looked at her cell phone screen, we see a system window seeing the discussion on channel 1. We see that the Babylon staff was closing the conquest of the 38th floor that week, and then they would send a communication tomorrow, but please, they should consult the conquest team. Soon Jio was exchanging messages with someone called Mommy's Boy. He says that in a country where there are 4S class hunters, it makes sense we are still stuck on the 30th floor, and still a top 3 hunter spends the day playing. But Gio asks if they didn't read web novels and says to make matters worse, the northern demon, Winters, was coming. Mommy's boy says with frustration that all she did was breathe and stay strong and asks her to please be aware, and says she should be ashamed to be seen by others like that. Soon a system window opens and says that regardless of whether it's true or not, the destiny reader is subtly suggesting, asking if the choice of words isn't a bit strong and another window says that he doesn't get along well with his sister, he was bothered by not letting his hair grow long. But she thinks she should be patient after all her brother was the one who gave her money at home. In the exchange of messages, her brother tells her to shut up for being too annoying. But she says no, she was a hidden guardian, and her brother says she didn't do anything. And she calmly replies that a guardian hides their strength. She thinks that of course the first place among those who do nothing is not criticized without reason. She thought as she walked along the wires that the Babel network automatically expands the servers of each country, depending on how many ranking hunters they have. Depending on the size of the server, the number of tickets varied from country to country, and the number of tickets was directly proportional to the number of awakened. As she jumped she thought that basically a small group of awakened sustained the whole country or something like that. The value of elite awakened in this period exceeded that of nuclear weapons from ancient times and by far. Korea had been marginalized and scorned by Babel, it went from an excluded nation to one of the main powers and was well aware of it. Soon Jio deactivates the cat parker, she arrives at the subway station and wonders where she should go since she left without a plan. If she goes home, she'll just hear sermons. But soon a red window behind her indicates a forced opening of cracks, and soon a window appears at the feet of a covered figure, saying she whispered to her contractor, Genjio, and a hooded figure indicates a crack ahead. Leaving Jio surprised and somewhat confused, she thought they were very close to the Seolung station. The next chapter begins with two beautiful presenters welcoming viewers. They wish everyone a good day and McMona introduces herself and is there to deliver the latest news from the world of Hunters, while her colleague introduces herself as McLisa. The show seemed to be broadcast from a building with a large antenna, they say the beautiful sound everyone heard last night was a sign that yes, the Dawn Guild, led by the sixth place in the ranking, presented the sound of victory to Korea after a long time. The young woman says that after five months, the 39th floor was finally unlocked, so everyone has high expectations. After all, as the last gate of the 30th floor, it is expected to have considerable difficulty. It is likely that each guild will recruit new hunters, and this happened a little before tutorial week. Lisa says that all floors of the tower will be closed due to the tutorial so each guild will have time to reorganize, so naturally all attention will be focused on the tutorial, especially floors 19, 29, and 39. There is a myth that hunters during the opening period of the ninth session are often chosen by the stars. 
in the year the 29th floor was unlocked, two super rookies named Joan Jai Rock and H. Wong Han appeared. The question that remains is whether they should expect the birth of a new S rank. On that day, the topic for the one minute of spotlight is the video that went viral. That video was sent by, if you are Korean join us, a well-known profile. It was the hero of Seolung Station, a video that Jill watched while eating chocolate pudding as she lay comfortably on her bed. Soon a message from her brother covers the hero's face, the message asking if she had seen the ranking window. She asks what he wanted and asks him to leave her alone, finding it strange that the ranking had been updated. And then she sees the number one. Her eyes gleam reflecting the number two, her brother laughs knowing that he knew this would happen. A window opens, saying that Jinjio's current national ranking is now second as she had dropped a position. Her brother asks in the message if she was crying, and that it could be a good thing, while her sister was completely confused and glitched. He continues, saying that she always had first place without doing anything, that could be very good, she could be more human now. As she read the suspended cell phone screen, she thought it had to be a dream. Her brother tells her to come home, their mother was waiting for her, and if she didn't come, he would put her on a wanted list. Meanwhile, Jill was immersed in an existential crisis and decides she wants her first place back. Far away, we see a guy with defined abs wearing only a towel and someone entering calling him vice president and asking for his permission. The person asks if he had any special visits scheduled for that day. He says with a cigarette in his mouth that the tutorial would start soon, so no. He asks if something happened, while we see his back completely covered in tattoos that looked like some symbols. And the person says there was a somewhat different visit waiting for him in the lobby. Downstairs the guards say she couldn't come in like that while one of them was about to use the radio to get Jio out of there. They tell Jio, who was sitting on the ground with crossed arms, that she couldn't force her way in there. As some people commented on the situation, the guards say that due to security, entry is not allowed for anyone except residents and authorized persons, and if she didn't leave, he would have to do it, and asks her to choose. She asks if they were awakened, and says she was a normal person, so if they touched her they would go to jail. They say that was the lobby where people come and go, so they couldn't even if they wanted to, but soon the girl feels like she was being suspended in the air. Then we see the vice president holding Joe by the hood, his name in the Babel Tower seemed to be Tiger. His age was unknown, he was also known as Gwiju, he was seventh place in Korea. He says she didn't need to apologize, as he himself would take care of it. Joe taunts them saying they have bad habits of wanting to touch people, and tells them to go away. Everyone then bows asking for pardon, the guard then greets Joe still standing and leads her inside much like a tiger carrying a kitten in its mouth. Already in the tiger's apartment, he says he gave her a key card and asks why she was making a fuss downstairs and she says she simply lost the card. He asks her to give him her phone, she was going to install a resident app. Meanwhile, he held her as if she weighed nothing to him. He then throws Gio on the couch while asking about her clothes as he had never seen them before. She says they were hers and asks if there was a problem. After all, she hadn't seen him in a long time. He says yes, it's hard to see her for sure. He bows behind her, blocking the sun, almost like an eclipse, he was so big. He says that after almost three months, she appears with oversized men's clothes and insists they were hers. She finally confesses that they were her brothers, Giant Jai Rock. He then says he knew the smell of Bambi and runs his hand over her face saying it was a very bad excuse. She says it doesn't matter, as he steps away, Jio says she had a reason to come here and asks if he was busy. He says as he prepares to take off his clothes that it's almost 11 o'clock, it's time to get ready. She then wonders what he meant after all and then remembers her brother saying goodbye to present at tutorial week. Tutorial week, the tutorial happens twice a year, giving rise to a new number of hunters during this period, entry to other floors of the tower is restricted. She wonders why he was explaining this, she says that if that happens that guy and that other guy would be together. As he took off his clothes, he says that what Gio wanted there was obvious, 
she wanted to be number one again. He then says he'll change clothes and they'll go to the tower together. As he moves away, he says she seemed to have lost weight and invites her to eat on the way. She then takes a deep breath and throws herself on the couch, thinking he was being nice as expected. The window says that her contractor makes a face to mock her for being caught and raises ethical questions to viewers asking why he undressed in front of a child, saying that this is against the age rating for display. That said, Gio wishes to be at least 10 years older and remembers the day she brought a bouquet of flowers to the tiger. And we see her holding back tears as she thinks that if she were older she wouldn't have been rejected. The window opens saying that her employer nods once saying that even though he's an unlucky guy, at least he agrees that he has awareness and common sense. And Gio wonders if she will keep teasing him. After putting on his suit, he tells Gio that he was ready and invites her to go. We then find out that the Silver Lion Guild is the largest and strongest in history. The guild leader was Lion, or Yoon Siok One, a representative of the first generation awakened. He firmly dominated first place in Korea until the appearance of Joon Jo. He's a mature man with a dark air who wore an eye patch. He was always on the front lines, a hunter who fought disasters. A veteran that Korea was proud of, respected by the world. Jo says she would then give him first place and asks how old Tiger's grandfather was, and asks if she wasn't ashamed of causing a commotion by taking the ranking from a poor student. But Tiger said he wasn't wrong, he didn't even need to talk about her laziness. She looks at the window sullenly, saying the old man would get a bone disease. Jio thought as she looked out the window that not much was known about Tiger except that Yoon Siak one caught him while he wandered the streets as a child, people could only imagine he was in his thirties. She thought that the huge seals engraved on his body are proof of his power and show that he personally visited the Great Witch of the Polar Regions. It was a well-known fact in the celestial world that he is a talented person with many secrets. He gained fame and recognition as the son and right-hand man of Silver Lion. About 10 years ago, he was chosen as the guardian of Korea's firstest rank, Joon Jio. He is one of the few people who know his identity, so things are as they are. Jio turns her attention to the tiger when he tells her that it's temporary and says that there are no more walls to cross. She remembers him saying that when he came out of the new fissure that was closing today. He closes his eyes as he says that it's the lion's last roar before dusk, so she tells him to respect that after all, everyone knew who was on top, while Joe watched him closely as he called her a wizard king. She turns her head, telling him to stop trying to calm her down by calling her an idiot. He says she seems to like that because she has a unique taste. He says that when he retires and his head changes, they'll have to start over. That was really a bit scary. But she says he's just a bastard tiger pretending to be strong but taking advantage of the weak. A snob who does nothing but scratch his belly. But the tiger just laughs with his hand over his mouth and says that was very cute. And she asks if he's just going to keep teasing her. Soon the car stops in front of the Tower of Babel. She says goodbye and says she'll go ahead while covering her neck. He wonders how he could deny the fact that she's cute. But anyway, she's still young. Back at Sulong Station, people were walking and going about their lives as usual. Jio realizes they were near Sialung Station. She takes her cell phone and sees a warning. Soon a voice orders citizens to evacuate the area immediately, as a sudden fissure had appeared and it was dangerous to stay there. Jo seemed to have been completely taken by surprise, the portal seemed to be the source of an overwhelming energy. The first wave of monsters seemed to be crushing a car in half, we see some sort of arachnid monster, and then we see two more coming out of the portal, totaling three in the image. Geo wonders if that isn't a desert spider, as the population flees, Geo thinks spiders usually don't travel alone, it would be annoying to have to deal with them, and there were many. So she covers herself while wondering if that was a level 6 fisher, and says that country really is a mess. Guards start calling citizens to head that way, to seek protection, and they ask them to move slowly according to the instructions and to stay calm. Soon one of the frightened citizens bumps into Jio, knocking her hood off. 
The window opens, saying that her contractor was wondering why she was still there. He was sure he told her there would be a fissure where he is. She then realizes her employer had appeared and hopes he won't become a problem again. And then asks why he's not responding again and asks if he's upset. She thinks all she needed was to go home safely and the guard points at her, indicating she should come towards him. So she wonders why, and he says it's dangerous for her to stay there. A young lady approaches and says that even in times like these, they should listen carefully to what public officials say so they'll stay together and safe. And she says her younger brothers and mother were waiting for her. The old lady says even if she's busy, that's neither the time nor the place and drags her away. She wonders if that's the Korean way, then suddenly someone descends from a rope in a helicopter. It was the rescue team that had arrived. The man says the rescue team had arrived, and orders to close the gate immediately. The employees recognize the man as Agent Kwon Jai Na, but soon someone yells not to close it. A woman cries saying her son was still inside the station, and the portal was right above the station entrance. The woman kneels crying as she calls for her son. A man watches the scene in silence, and then someone is heard saying he's a hunter, and he'll bring her son out. Soon we see many civilians hiding behind various police barriers. Gio sends a message asking for help to her brother, but there's no available connection, which shocks her. She thinks they're really stuck. It will take quite a while for the situation to be resolved and traffic to return to normal. She thinks even if she left home without thinking, it doesn't mean she doesn't plan to come back. She then puts her hand on her chin and starts thinking, she says on second thought, that seemed to be the safest place, she then hears someone talking. The monsters were approaching, and the civilians were asking if there were any awakened ones around, there were many people crowding there. John asked if he should take action, as the rescue team had arrived, maybe she should just mind her own business. The spider gets even closer to the barrier, officers order everyone to get ready to shoot, then they give the order as the spider approaches rapidly. Everyone approaches and shoots, the gunfire was quite powerful, they seem to be explosive bullets. Their leader speaks through the loudspeaker telling them to stay in formation. The young leader says they couldn't even set up a barricade properly, and how did they intend to do something if they were panicking because of the level 5 monster? That young man was a BBB class hunter, a member of the first quick response team of rescue and suppression affiliated with the center, Kwon Jai Na. Those words soon make the others apologize and reorganize. Night begins to fall, the rescue and suppression team had arrived and asked why the gate was still not closed. Agent Kwon Jai Na is not enough. The two guards wondered what had happened. One of them says there's a child who couldn't get out of the station, and an F-rank jumped in to try to save the child, despite being only an F-rank, and they were waiting for him to come out. The guard says the location was awful and wonders why it had to appear right at the station entrance. His colleague wonders if they shouldn't go in to try to rescue the S-rank. The young man then asks if he doesn't know how capricious those fissures are, even if they don't close on their side. They couldn't ignore the possibility that it closes on its own suddenly, and if something like that happens, they couldn't come back," says the guard as he stomps his foot. Even the rank DS didn't want to go in, they were all hesitating too. The D ranks also didn't want to go in, they were all hesitating like that. The guard still hoped that she could come back if she does, he'll be a hero. And they just think that if at any moment he emerges from that station with that portal, he'll surely be a hero. Soon more spiders emerge catching the guard's attention, the leader says that team I will advance into the station, soon an older man catches Kwon Jai Na's attention. The man says that if he hasn't come out yet, it means those creatures have nested inside the station, he asks if Kwon doesn't know they should close it immediately, it could become a disaster if all of them come out. Kwong then simply says he can close it because he's going in. He then grabs the man by the collar, threateningly saying he's going in to rescue the guy who went in, and says if the man wanted to close it, he should do it himself. But soon the man is surprised to hear someone saying they were coming out. As the man exits, the guards order the medical team to bring a stretcher immediately. He then places the boy on the ground, as the team approaches carrying a stretcher. 
while the men watch, an F rank comes out of there just like the child. Kuang sees their eyes gleaming and calls him a hero. The man squats in front of the boy and says it's over, that everything is okay. Kuang approaches to ask if he could ask his name, the man is silent for a moment and introduces himself as Beak Doyan. He approaches as everyone applauds the hero who saved the child. Even Jio applauds, relieved that everything had finally ended. She then asks if they could go home now because she also wanted to see her bed, or rather, her mother. She says their families were very worried at home, and this makes all the civilians eager to leave too because it was getting late. Soon everyone starts removing the barriers and our young girl celebrates being finally free. And soon a notification window opens saying that Jio had gained an attribute called bait. Jio's contractor sighs, saying he didn't know where she learned so many bad things, and parents still say they don't know where children learn these things by walking around, and Jio walked with her arms crossed asking who she was talking to. She then yawns as she heads home, writing a diary and then sleeping would be perfect after a day like that. But soon someone runs and grabs her arm, which completely surprises her, the man asks her to please help him. In another plane, a kind of deity watches the man asking for help for Jio. He sits in a temple among the stars, and seemed to smile like someone who seemed to have plans for the guy. He then thinks that if she goes now, Quan Jai Na will die. And not only Quan Jai, it would be most of the people there too. And she removes her hand wondering what he was talking about, he says hunters and civilians will die defenseless. The man says with heavy eyes that the area around the station will become a huge memorial. And we get a glimpse of what he was talking about, indeed the station had become a huge memorial. We see the man with an umbrella in the rain putting flowers on the memorial stone where Quan Jian Na's tomb was. Then we see him facing Zhou again, he says that the manticore that will appear soon is a level 3 monster. He then says however that this is a mutant species so it was classified as a level 2 disaster. He asks if she has any way to verify if what he was saying is true. Jio stays silent for a moment, and the young man pleads, and the man asks if you think you know who she was, and he says yes, calling Jo the wizard queen. Soon the portal increases activity, and everyone shouts that it still hadn't closed and wondered why it had closed. They receive orders to report quickly, the man introduces himself as Beak Du Hyun. His contractor's unique ability and the library ability activated, he thinks of checking Jian and Jio's permission and his verification is completed. Specify an area, and the window asks if she would like to proceed with the verification of Beak Du Hyun. She responds yes in thought, and soon a window opens revealing that his type was human. His date of birth was with a reading error. His full file then appears, he was 25 years old, was F-class, was a brave defender of justice, his unique title is Second Chance, the one who fights against time, protagonist in a failed world. Jio seems to find something different, his Second Chance title. Looking at him, she asks about what this title means, the protagonist of a failed world. He then asks if she believes him now, he says they didn't have much time, and Jio says in that case she had some conditions. He says he accepts anything. She then raises her finger and says that when they finish there, he wouldn't come looking for her again. And she walks away angrily saying that if he comes after her again, she would kill him. She runs away wondering if the protagonist managed to go back in time, and didn't seem happy because she didn't know what kind of world he lived in, but wonders how could there be a person like that. As she approached the portal, she was still complaining, it would certainly be annoying to get involved in this. She looked at the gate from afar, behind a corner of an alley. And at Gio's house, the news was already on the front pages of the newspapers, Gio's brother was surrounded by notification windows. The intense discussion seemed to be a quite problematic issue. He then scratches his head leaning back. He remained silent as he read people speculating about the personality of the top ranked one. He then gets up from the computer and says she just doesn't do anything out of simple laziness, not out of malice. But he thought something happened that time for sure. And soon something catches his attention. Behind him a voice says hello. 
The door opens as a black aura emanates in the room, she says that the last time she contacted her was to talk about the gang Wundu Temple. It was her mother, talking about a 20-year-old girl, she was sitting on the floor on the phone asking if they could take care of her and would send her to the temple. While her brother watched everything covering his mouth with his hand, he picks up the phone while wishing her to enjoy her last moments of freedom. Soon we see a notification window, the contractor's unique ability, library activated, appears for Jio. Soon after we see a book with two padlocks, another window saying that Jio's identity had been confirmed. She then tells the book to document the information within a 1km radius, soon a pen materializes in Jio's hand. And soon several notification windows open around her, she soon sees a lion with two large wings, she says she will eliminate any possibility of that fissure opening. And the young man is impressed to realize that the future was disappearing. Gio asks if he knows anything else, and asks him to speak quickly and not forget anything. He says yes after all, he can see with his own eyes. That person who was rewriting events was the Wizard Queen. Geo overflowed with power as she wrote, soon a notification window says that development was completely altered. She then asks if that was enough right. She then runs away, saying it was embarrassing to stand next to him, and says she hopes to never see him again. As she ran, she thought that Guy spends all his time reading web novels, and thought that what was going to happen was that the main character would definitely want to be by the strongest and Joe imagined him asking her to follow him to the Tower of Babel and pursue her for the rest of her life, until her old age. And soon her cell phone in the back pocket starts vibrating, so she hides in a corner because she finally got a Wi-Fi network and wonders who would message in such a situation. And soon she is shocked to look at the cell phone screen, it was her brother revealing that her sister was on the phone in the living room and a photo of him laughing a lot and then a photo of her mother on the floor on the phone. He says it seemed like she was consulting a temple somewhere, Gang Wan Du, but he heard that if he goes there, he'll have to pray every morning, and says she enjoys her last days in the world. Meanwhile in the city, the guy was wondering where she was, and it was getting late. Soon he finds her on a corner, she was calling him by name with a dark aura around her. She asks if he had anywhere to stay or any money, and he innocently asks. She then slaps him in disappointment and then pulls her hair back, asking if she could spend the night with him. He then becomes expressionless as he looks at Gio, and she continues to charm her way out of the beast waiting for her at home, and soon he screams in the middle of the city surprised at what she wanted. Soon we are taken to a memory of the mysterious young man. The dragons hovered in the sky, while someone asked Jian Jai to come back to himself. We see Jian in the arms of the guy, he was feeling severe pain and completely injured, and yet she still laughed. Jian smiled even in such a difficult moment, seeing that Beak remained so kind. He saw the dragons hovering above them, Jian asks what he would say if he told him he hadn't used the God X machine yet, but Beak says it's not time to play, he needs to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. But Jian pulls Beak's collar and looks with very alive and determined eyes, telling him to remember not to tell anyone what he will see from that point on. Beak seems surprised and Gen tears off his necklace. And then we see Jian die as an energy explosion occurs behind Beak. Looking at it, he wonders what was happening now, still with Jian dead in his arms. And suddenly, the dragons and monsters begin to be completely evaporated, turning only to dust, while Beak covers his face. And when he looks up again, he sees someone stopping amidst the clouds, he recognizes her as the Wizard Queen. She was riding on a giant dragon, she then lands on the ground, she touches the ground lightly and delicately, she then approaches slowly, asking if Beak did this for Joan, and asks him to tell only the truth. He says it wasn't his fault, even though he didn't hurt him, he hurt himself because of him, so he apologizes. The Wizard Queen asks the young man's name, and Beak introduces himself. She then falls silent, and lowers her hood saying that the Guardian of Kindness was a quite impressive title, and Beak looks at her without understanding. She smiles gently, and says she will make things a little difficult for him. We are then taken back to Beak's house. 
He enters with a bag saying he brought a toothbrush and other basic necessities, and when he opens the door he sees her lying down playing with her cell phone while his room was completely messy. She then looks at him and asks him to bring her Malona, a Korean melon ice cream, she asks why the Wi-Fi password is so easy, it was just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. He then gives her the melon ice cream, but before she takes it he pulls it back asking for something in return. He asks her to promise him that she will brush her teeth and organize her socks and sandals, which makes her call him annoying. He says no, she needs to do that or she'll get cavities because she had also eaten sweets. She agrees and asks him to give her the ice cream already. He says he will give her some clothes to change into to sleep. She says she was already in comfortable clothes while struggling for the popsicle. He says if she sleeps in those clothes, he might develop a dust allergy. And she then celebrates the fact that she got the popsicle, while he thought it seemed like he was dealing with a cat. As she eats her ice cream, she wonders if he didn't seem sad for someone who left home. As he raises an alert window appears, and not just for her, for all of Korea, floor number 38 of the Tower of Babel was completed, the Dawn Guild rang the victory bell. Soon on the Tower's channel, everyone starts celebrating the Guild Dawn's feat, and Jio reads everything while eating her popsicle. While everyone tries to get Jio's attention, she feeds the mystery of her identity. She then enters the bathroom, while still reading people asking where she was. As she eats she thinks that the user David was always the best and her favorite and as expected of her, she was very smart even without studying. Soon she receives messages from her brother, he was asking why she didn't come home, and asks if she really just lives in the now like a fly. She looks at it before lying down to sleep and lies down thinking she didn't even know what to do, but somehow she knew she'd figure it out. She then asks if it's a little late for that question, but asks if Beak sleeps alone. He asks why she's awake, but says yes, he lived alone. He says to begin with, he has no brother, and his parents died in a car accident when he was a child, he lived in an orphanage until elementary school, but after that, he lived alone, and asks why she was interrogating him so suddenly, she rubs her eyes saying it's just because she's at someone's house she doesn't know, so she felt like getting to know him better. And it would be the same for her, since she is a woman he doesn't know. He says he didn't even know her name, and she is surprised that he doesn't know her name. He says Geo and the Wizard Queen is all he knew, besides the fact that she is younger than him. He then opens his eyes as he sees her move, she puts her feet on the floor, and he looks surprised as she positions herself in front of him and looks at him from above, asking if he returned without knowing anything about her. She squats in front of him blocking the moonlight, while asking if they weren't very close, he then becomes withdrawn and looks at his pillow. He says they only talked once and remembers her carrying Jeon's body to his dragon, the dragon then opens its gigantic wings and says he didn't tell anyone, but he would never forget what happened that day. His eyes lit up as the dragon flew through the air, and soon the dragon moves away as he looks up enchanted, determined to keep that moment until the day he dies. Jio then says her own name, which confuses him, she then introduces herself smiling as Jian Jio, that was her name and says as he looks down embarrassed that it's not like he didn't know her name. And he agrees that's true and continues lying turned to the pillow while she watches him from above.